I got a lot of really interesting questions the last couple of days, and I haven't done a question and answer video for a while, so I felt it makes sense to do one today. Now, there was one question in particular that triggered this video, and that is a question regarding the Adobe Atmos renderer crashing in Windows directly after startup. That is a bug in the Adobe Atmos renderer that I actually ran into myself. Fortunately, there's a very simple fix. So if you're here for that particular question, I'm going to answer that towards the end of this video. Feel free to use the timestamps in order to jump ahead. But with that being said, let's get started. But first of all, hello everybody. In case you're new here, my name is Michael Wagner. I'm a digital media educator with more than 30 years of experience in higher education. And on this channel, I talk about digital media, game design, and spatial audio. Today, about a couple of questions that you guys had. If any of those topics interest you, I invite you to subscribe or join my Discord community. Invite link is in the description below, or there's also a QR code here somewhere. And with that being said, let's get to the first question. Thank you very much for the interesting videos. Well, thank you. I was wondering, what do you think are the best use cases for Ambisonics and Dolby Atmos in interactive game audio? When is which one preferred? Now that's a really interesting question because it addresses a misconception that many people have about the use of immersive audio in game design and in particular the use of Dolby Atmos in game design. One thing to remember is that game design by definition is object oriented and uh, game audio therefore by definition is object oriented. If you're putting audio into a game, the way you're doing that is by creating sound objects in your game. The reason you're doing that is because it needs to be able to react to the player interaction. So the audio isn't really presented to you to you in the way it was originally uh, created, it is presented to you in a way that con is consistent with the actions of the player within the game. And the audio therefore needs to be rendered in real time. And the way this is usually done is by placing the audio objects into your three-dimensional space and then giving them certain uh, properties that allow them to interact with the player in just the very same way any game object would interact with the player. Now you would think that that makes a format like Dolby Atmos perfect for game design and that is actually not really correct because in Dolby Atmos, the movement of the objects are defined in advance, whereas in game design, the movement of the, of the objects depend on the player interaction. So uh, in that sense, uh, the Dolby Atmos format isn't really particularly useful in game design itself. However, one thing that you can do, and that is currently done, is that you are representing the audio to the player in a Dolby Atmos format. And this is done through the game engine itself. Now, the reason you do it to the game engine is simply because in a game you don't have uh, only 128 objects like you would have in Dolby Atmos. In a game, you usually have thousands, maybe tens of thousands of game objects, of sound objects. And as a result of that, you cannot simply kind of assign each object in the game a object in the Dolby Atmos output. What you actually have to do is you have to intelligently, or the game engine has to intelligently uh, figure out which objects or which sound objects in the game are channeled into what Atmos objects. And it has to do that in real time. And this is something that is done uh, without interference of the game designer. This is something that the game on, or the engine just does by itself. So if you are producing game audio, you actually never touch that. Uh, you don't have to think about Dolby Atmos in games because the game engine does that for you. Um, and uh, if you're interested in how that actually works, I, I did a video about that once and I'm going to leave a link in the description below. Uh, and there you can actually check out how uh, Dolby Atmos is, uh, how somebody would work with Dolby Atmos in a game engine such as Unity, for example. Now, in terms of Ambisonics, that is a slightly different story because Ambisonics is essentially a format that allows you to really capture uh, ambient sounds. So you can use ambisonics in games in the form of uh, ambiences. So if you want to bring in certain, um, you know, kind of Foley recordings that are done in 3D, then you can definitely do that. And all game engines are actually capable of uh, handling ambisonics audio. However, um, it's not necessarily something that is done very often, simply because you can get the same effects with just game objects. You don't really need Ambisonics, but this is actually something that you could do. So Ambisonics actually makes sense, but you would only really do that for ambiences. This is really the only use case. There's no other particular use case for Ambisonics in game design. So once again, most of the time, you're just working with audio objects in a game, and, uh, and that's pretty much it. Um, and you never touch Dolby Atmos or sometimes you might kind of consider taking in uh, ambisonics as something that is useful for creating ambient sounds. 
But that doesn't necessarily mean that there might not be a future for Dolby Atmos in game design itself. Uh, one thing that you can think of, for example, is that you could have a tool that would allow you to take a Dolby Atmos master file and convert the objects in a Dolby Atmos master file into a game object so that you can then essentially utilize them in, uh, in game design. Uh, and that is something that might be useful. I'm not aware that such a tool exists at that point. It might. I'm not particularly familiar with all the recent developments in that particular space, but this is something that I could see could become useful at some point. But there was an additional question that I would like to throw in here. Somebody asked me if it is possible to record uh, the Dolby Atmos master file that comes out of a game. So when I'm playing a game, essentially, that I have a recorder next to me that would essentially kind of record the Dolby Atmos master file as a master file. And the answer to that is no. And the reason simply is because it wouldn't actually make a whole lot of sense to do that. There is no Dolby Atmos master file in the game itself. The Dolby Atmos, um, with all the objects and everything, is created in real time, on the fly, as you're playing the game. And uh, so kind of recording that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Um, maybe it might, you know, kind of if you have different opinions, let me know uh, in the comment section. But my feeling is that that's probably not particularly useful. And I'm also not really aware of any tool that would allow you to really record that. The second question is with respect to a video that I did about tone boosters and particularly the use of the tone boosters equalizer in conjunction with manipulating ambisonics audio. And it goes as follows. I absolutely love the tone boosters suit. Many do. Your video makes me realize that you can use the Tone Boosters compressors multi-channel routing to do some creative spatial side chaining as well. Now this is actually correct and in preparing that video I actually thought about including the compressor in that video but I then decided against it simply because the compressor works a little differently to the equalizer and it would have been confusing to do both in one video. I might do a compressor video in the future but I'm not completely sure because it's, it's actually relatively straightforward. But you can use the compressor in exactly the same way by utilizing the multi-channel capabilities and then applying the compressor to only certain channels in your ambic sonic signal and that allows you to do some spatial mid-side process processing in exactly the same way I used the equalizer. So you can actually do that. Now, it, it, it kind of deserves mentioning that it's not only the compressor and the equalizer that have multi-channel capabilities in the Tone Booster suit. There are also other plugins that have multi-channel and one in particular is the DSer. So you could technically also use the DSer. I just didn't get anything useful out of the DSer, but uh, your results may vary. But uh, once again, um, the Tone Booster suit is really nice and a couple of those plugins can be used in order to do this uh, spatial mid-side processing that I showed. You really need to adjust your thinking towards EQ and its effects working in ambisonics mode. It really challenges general destination type of sound analysis greatly. It's useful, I believe, but it could be very destructive very, very quickly. Well, first of all, thank you for that comment. And I tried to make that clear in my very first video about spatial mid-side processing. Uh, and, um, you know, kind of, I probably should kind of reiterate that point. Uh, when I talk about spatial mid-side processing, and for those of you who haven't seen these videos, that is simply the idea that you use an ambisonic signal in order to manipulate the side channels. Uh, so in an ambisonic signal, very simply put, the, uh, the first order ambisonics channels, which are the channels 2, 3, and 4, are the side channels for the uh, essentially stereo direction, the uh, vertical direction, and the depth direction. And you can manipulate them in exactly the same way you would manipulate the side channel in a traditional mid-side processing paradigm. That's what I call uh, spatial mid-side processing. Once again, if you're interested in how that works, video link in the description below. Now, the thing that's really important to understand here is that if you do that, you are manipulating the, um, the spatial nature to the point where you can actually destruct everything. So you need to use that method with caution. Um, but one thing that I would say is that this is true for pretty much everything that we do. So if you're working in a creative way, if you're using things creatively, you always need to be aware that you are eventually destructing things, right? So if you're, even if you're doing compression, for example, if you're compressing your signal to, if you're compressing the life out of your signal, right? So in, in the end, you're destroying your signal or a bit crusher, right? So if you're, if you're crushing too many bits, it destroys the audio completely or uh, distortion, right? That, that is the very definition of destruction. So, um, Yes, uh, you are destroying the parts of your three-dimensional sound. And that's just in the very same way uh, every creative effect would eventually destroy the signal if you take it too far. 
And another comment that uh, addresses something with ambisonics, um, and it, it reads, I'm not sure why you say there's no such thing as a negative microphone, just invert the polarity. Now, in case you're missing the context, what the uh, comment is about is uh, about my comments that I made about the idea of virtual microphones in the ambisonic signal. You know, kind of if you think about the polar patterns that you have uh, with the virtual microphones in uh, in the way you kind of usually kind of uh, represent ambisonics, I might put up a, an image here somewhere. There are certain parts of these polar patterns that are negative and certain parts that are positive. And I make a point that uh, saying that there is no way to actually do that physically. So you cannot really construct a microphone that way. Now, this is not entirely correct. And thank you once again for that particular comment, because what you could essentially do is you could take two microphones. If you, for example, have like a polar pattern where one end of one side is negative and one is positive, you could take two uh, microphones and then essentially invert one of them. Um, but the problem still remains that you can't really put the microphones into the, into the very same spot. So technically it is not entirely possible, but to some extent, theoretically, you could do that. So once again, thank you for clarifying that. I'm going to be a little bit more careful kind of about talking about negative pickup patterns and just kind of making sure that everybody understands that in theory, yes, this is possible to do, but just in practice, uh, you can't really do it in a way that is accurate enough for, for that particular microphone to really function correctly. Another ambisonics question that I actually get quite often, um, and it goes. So the first four channels of the higher order ambisonic signal correspond to a first order ambisonic signal, question mark. Yes, that is absolutely correct. And this is one of the things that a lot of people don't really realize. Uh, in a higher order ambisonic signal, um, essentially the first four are just the first order ambisonics channels. Um, so if you want to convert the third order into first order, you'll just leave out everything but the first four. Now, the same goes for the higher order ambisonics channels. So if you're only interested in the second order ambisonics uh, signal, then essentially all you have to do is just drop the last seven from the third order ambisonics and you're left with this second order ambisonics channel. This is one of the really nice things about ambisonics, that it that's it's almost like a Russian doll. Where essentially, you start out with first order ambisonics, and then you're just adding up, adding the additional higher order channels in order to make it more accurate. But yes, um, if you have a third order ambisonic signal, and you're just leaving out everything but the first four, you're ending up with the first order ambisonic signal. The next comment was made in response to the video I did on the Skydust 3D synth. Once again, uh, link in the description below, and it goes as follows. Man, good effort learning the synth, of course. Good quality of the video and good understanding of how to design a synth sound. But from the 20 minutes I watched, you didn't stop talking over the sounds. So I couldn't get the spatial movement because there was no, because there was your very loud comments on it. Come on. Well, first of all, thank you for this comment. And I left it in here deliberately because I wanted to talk about how I actually do my videos or why I do my videos. Now, I'm not a professional YouTuber and I'm also not really aspiring to become one, to be perfectly honest. I have a very good and very demanding uh, day job. And this is really something that I, do, that I do on the side. It does feed into my activities in my day job and I can use some synergies. Uh, many of the things that I show off here are things that I also use in my teaching and vice versa. But in the end, it's something that I do on the side, uh, usually kind of over the weekend. And uh, then I kind of do the videos sometime, usually on Mondays. But uh, because of that, I essentially learn as I go. And I also need to be as efficient as possible in creating these videos. One of the things that, uh, that you might have noticed is that I'm not really scripting my videos. So I'm just going to sit down and kind of talk. That's, that's the way I do that. As a result of that, sometimes I may speak. I, I, I tend to leave that in there and don't do too much ed editing, but that's sort of the way I approach it. I feel that kind of sounds a little or kind of feels a little bit more natural. However, um, I'm, I'm really interested to improve. And uh, so these types of comments are really important to me because I actually didn't think that I kind of uh, had, I actually felt that I was speaking too fast, <laughs> to be perfectly honest, and, uh, and kind of kind of learning that uh, some of you might have actually been interested to hear a little bit more about the sound, and <laughs> not me talking is really is really important to me. Now, over the next couple of weeks and months, I plan to professionalize my uh, video production, you might have noticed that over the last couple of weeks, I started to color grade my videos. So I'm now at the point where I'm reasonably happy with the visual and the auditory quality of my videos, but that's supposed to be improved over the next couple of weeks and months. But this is a gradual process and uh, comments like this are important for me because they tell me or they kind of give me the direction that I should go, should go into. So thanks again for kind of noting that and uh, I'll try my best to leave a little bit more space for the sounds in case I ever review a synth again.
Yo, Michael, you never answered my posts and my questions were left unanswered. They were the only unanswered comments on your videos. So I just deleted them thinking you didn't like my questions. Well, first of all, let me point out that there are no questions that I do not like. There might be questions that I can't answer. There are actually quite a few of them, but there are never questions that I do not like. So if I haven't answered your question, I apologize. I do try to answer all questions and comments that are coming in, at least for the moment. But it's honestly getting more and more complicated. Um, as I'm inching in on 10,000 subscribers, which is a number that I never thought would be possible, um, still very small in YouTube terms, but kind of, for me personally, kind of just imagining 10,000 people is kind of a big number. But I'm getting to the point that uh, essentially it becomes really, really difficult to keep track of everything that is coming in and all the comments that are made. And your comments in particular came in at a time where there was a lot of activity on the video about the Dolby Atmos composer from Fiedler Audio. And this was actually the first time where I got a little bit overwhelmed by the number of comments that were coming in simultaneously. So if I haven't answered your question, I apologize. Uh, that can happen and it will probably happen more in the future. If you want to be sure that uh, we address your question or that I address your question, uh, my recommendation would be to sign up for the Discord server. It's completely free. I'm not kind of charging anything for anybody. And there's a lot of activity there and there are a lot of people there and I haven't seen any question ever unanswered on the Discord server. So if you're, if you're really kind of interested in learning about something and have a question that needs to be answered, um, the better way probably is to go uh, on the Discord server. Once again, link in the description below and there you get your question answered. But once again, um, I apologize. I intend to answer all questions on the YouTube channel, on the YouTube uh, videos, but it gets more and more complicated to do that. And finally, the one question that caused me to create this video. As soon as I'm trying to open the Dolby Atmos renderer, it closes abruptly with no error. Working on Windows, please help. Now that is actually a bug in the Dolby Atmos renderer. Now depending on when you watch this video, Dolby might have released a bug fix, but at the time I'm recording this video, that bug was still active, uh, alive and kicking. Uh, so under certain circumstances, the Dolby Atmos renderer will essentially um, not kind of load up completely. It will You will essentially get the splash screen and then the initial window and then it will hang for a couple of seconds and simply close without any error message whatsoever. Now, the reason this is it is doing that is because there is an issue in the way the Dolby Atmos renderer communicates with some ESIO devices. So uh, when the Dolby Atmos renderer starts up, it is going through all the ESIO devices that you have on your system, and there are certain ESIO devices that then essentially capture the renderer, and for whatever reason, that causes it to crash uh, in a very weird way. Now, fortunately, there's a very simple fix because they only really need to to do is figure out which of the ESIO devices is causing the issue and then simply uninstalling it. And you can do that by going into the uh, registry editor uh, and uh, and just deleting the entry that is responsible for the Dolby Atmos renderer crashing. Uh, so let me show you how you can actually do that. So all you really need to do is uh, you need to open up the registry editor by calling reg edit and uh, Say yes here, and then go to the following key, uh, computer, H key, local machine, uh, software, ESIO, and here you will find all the ESIO devices or ESIO drivers that you have on your system. And if the Adobe Atmos renderer crashes, chances are that one of them is responsible for these crashes. So what you need to do is you need to figure out which of the uh, ESIO devices is uh, responsible for crashing the Adobe Atmos renderer. Now, in my particular case, it was the FL Studio ESIO driver, and I heard from a number of other people uh, where it also was the FL Studio ESIO driver. So if your Adobe Atmos renderer is crashing, and you have FL Studio installed, chances are it is the FL Studio is your driver that is causing the Dolby Atmos renderer to crash. So all you really need to do is you need to delete that key here. Um, if it's not FL Studio, it might be one of the other easier drivers, then you need to go through them and kind of try to figure out which one it is. Uh, best way to do that is by try and error. One of the recommendations that was made on the Dolby Atmos forum was to simply delete all the easier devices that you don't need at all, um, only leaving the ones that you actually really use and then uh, in 99.9% .9 of the cases, that bug should no longer appear and you should be able to load up the Dolby Atmos renderer just fine. So this is really everything I wanted to see today. Thanks again for watching. I hope you enjoyed uh, my little question and answer session. If you have more questions that require an answer, please leave them in the comment section below or once again, join our Discord community. In the link is in the description below. And with that being said, see you at the next video.